my prayers have been answered tonight. <laughs> Last time I saw Mr. Art Skipsy was down in uh, at Qualicum, and uh, we were working at a deal for the swan to be donated to the Maritime Heritage, and it's good to see you again tonight. Seems like wherever you go, trouble follows you. <laughs> so, Art, come on up, and uh, you know like we've gone through uh, a lot of the stuff already. But maybe you can just give us some recollections of why you did what you did, and uh, would you do it again if you had the opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Art Skipsy. Well, I'll put on a hat here. <laughs> well, I must say I've had a love affair with boats all my life. When I was a teenager, I made uh, model boats. And then uh, when I got to, no, when I was uh, earlier than that, a few years, maybe uh, 11, 12, something like that. And then when I learned to swim in that, I bought an Indian canoe for $4 and a paddle for $2. <laughs> and I used to coast down or go on the current, put up a sail and sail up again. And uh, so I had a, say, a love affair with boats uh, all my life. Now, uh, I got, I got, uh, what, given the swan because I built a speedboat and I had a speedboat with a six cylinder dodge in it and across the uh, other side, uh, Arthur Jeb had um, one with a V8 in it and so we became attached because of that. Now, also at his place, he had a little railway uh, made with poles, and uh, and he had cut wheels. And uh, if he broke some more ribs in the boat, he just pull it up and put some more tin over it. <laughs> and um, uh, so we became quite good friends. And he, his wife, knitted. Christmas stockings for I think for our first three children, and we still uh, have those stockings. So we had a, a long uh, association like that, and uh, I don't remember this, but I I was told that I sold the swan to somebody for two dollars, and uh, when they got to take it away, it was too heavy, and they couldn't do it, and it ended up on L. Greenhall's um, beach, and his son got tired of uh, bailing it, and so they took it out offshore a bit, and I remember rocks a lot, I didn't see them there, but uh, uh, I think they drilled a hole in the bottom or something, and then uh, a friend of his from England stood on the deck, front deck, and saluted as it sank. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, his son, oh, when we were storing it, he said, uh, uh, I said about getting the steering wheel for it. No, no, he said, I promised that to my son. Well, I tell you, you tell your son, if I don't get that steering wheel, he didn't get it right in the boat. <laughs> and he didn't. <laughs> so I, I, had, I made two steering wheels, one for the front, and one further back, because if you're in a steamboat, the main thing is to be able to watch your gauges and everything, and you can't do that sitting up front. Now, when the uh, sawmill got it, uh, and, 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 and Arthur Jeb looked after it for the sawmill, um, they took the steam engine out of the back. Originally, it had a steam engine. I think it belonged to A.W. Neal and went up to uh, Sprout Lake in 1927. And as far as we know, it was built about 1890, but there's no markings on it. So it was an old boat from the beginning. And so uh, my wife and I were traveling around the States and we were at the Grand Canyon one day and, and I woke up and said, I know where there's a classic boat. And she, no, 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 <laughs> not if I've been to do it. And so, um, uh, I, uh, 
I, it, it came in the paper that I was going to, uh, to, to raise it. And I think about 35 people phoned up to say that they would be interested in helping with this. Uh, and I think six showed up. <laughs> and one of them, I can spot him here, he's probably in here. Uh, um, he, he came about four or five times and then he fell off the roof and broke his leg. I think it was just to get out for help in there. <laughs> and then my friend John Super, he came every day. John, show your hand or something. There's his brother here, Tony. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, John came every day. And um, we put in uh, 51 or two uh, ribs in it. And there were half ribs to the keel. And um, we put in about 120 feet of planking. And people were interested in it. And one of my former students gave me all the cedar we needed for planking. He had a little sawmill over, or a woodlot over in back of, in, in a parcel there. And we could go and uh, help ourselves to it. And so we picked out the very best and uh, <laughs> took it there. And one day, I don't know what you've seen, if you showed any pictures or not, but uh, one day we were putting this uh, plank in the place there, and uh, it was something, uh, I'll, well, pick a number. Say, I uh, needed uh, 11 foot, uh, 11 and a half inches, and this boat was 11 and a half, three quarter inches. We cut a quarter inch off, <laughs> and it came to that that fine point. And then when we put it in place, John and I just had a good laugh to think that was, we could do all that. Uh, he couldn't have uh, replaced the ribs, but when we got it, we had to strip it right out, all the decking out of it, and take the old engine out of the front. Now, putting the engine in the front as they did, and it had a long shaft, and some of this will show up on the waterfront there uh, next summer. Uh, they put a uh, engine out of a Ross carrier up in the front, and uh, then they could take about 12 uh, loggers, mostly uh, fallers and uh, uh, fallers and buckers, into the seating area at the back. And uh, uh, but when it was empty, it was hard to steer because it's bow heavy, and so it earned the name of the snake. <laughs> it came down uh, like a snake down the. Down the, down the lake. Uh, now, when we got it uh, finished, we went, oh, well, after we raised it, and you've heard about the raising here, and I, I've been struggling to find the name of the doctor who was also a marine biologist. He worked at the hospital, and uh, he sort of became the um, director of operations and we started off lifting it one day and it fell back down again. And so he said, okay, we're gonna get some barrels. And we got some uh, 45 gallon barrels and we had cages, uh, webbing cages made to fasten it. And uh, we got it up finally. Uh, my son Joe got a great big pump and we towed it down to uh, our, where our lot is and we started pumping on it and we could raise it about four inches, and if you shut the pump up, down she go again. <laughs> and so we had great discussions whether we should take it right across, um, or whether we should just let it sink out in the middle of the lake. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, we decided we'd take it across, and oh, I, Joe, just say my, Joe and my daughter, Jane, and a few of them, uh, when we went to talk to Al Greenhalgh about it, he, we went out one day and we determined it was in about 60 feet of water where it had gone down, where we gave it the honorable burial. And uh, Joe went down and we took a knife and he was stabbing it to see whether it was sound or not. And it generally seemed to be sound. And then I, to back up, I got John Monacrief, Monac Monofrey to go down and check also because uh, I was a born optimist and 
<laughs> John would go down and, and check it out. And John saw it was all right too. So anyway, we took it across, towed it over to the boat launch, and we had a fellow come to haul it out of there. And when he got it up, he wanted us to put some braces on the cabin, and he had a feeling that if we hit a bad bump, it might just all melt off the trailer. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, when he got it out, he said, okay, you go get some wood and brace that and so on. And we go. So we went along at a, a good uh, uh, speed, I guess, but we were well under the limit and going around Cameron Lake and you know, he'd pull over and once in a while, let somebody go by. And he said, and when we get to that railway crossing, before we go into Qualicum there, I'm gonna slow it way down because if we hit that bump, I don't want it to melt there. <laughs> <laughs> and we brought it home and we put it in to uh, beside uh, uh, a garage I had there. And I don't know how he did it, but he put it in the exact place the first try. And then after that, we had to work it over a series of blocks to, as it supported to bring it, to bring it out. And we finally got it out, and we built a bit of a shelter over top of it so we could work in the dry. And uh, we built a, a steam box so we could bend the the uh, ribs and that. And uh, in eight months, we had it uh, ready for the water. And I got I got a fellow who lives up in Qualica Bay, who uh, was old boat builder sort of thing, and had him do all the caulking. And we, and I uh, had another friend down in uh, Nanus Bay who had rebuilt a, um, a boat down there, he had built his own boat. And he said, I said, how many caulking tubes do you think I need? And he said, oh, about a dozen, he thinks. Anyway, I think I ended up buying at least 30 of them. <laughs> <laughs> and filled them all up. And then we, when we had it, that done, <clears throat> and we put the, uh, lifted the engine into place, and I got the, that all lined up. Uh, other people brought in, uh, another fella brought in, uh, Dougal brought along some uh, yellow cedar, and he milled it all for me to make a uh, front deck out of it. And uh, <clears throat> we got it all done, and then we put a skirt around it and left the hose running in there so that it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't dry out before we got about back in the lake. And we brought it back into the lake and we had, uh, um, let's see, we, we, we put it in the lake and towed it back over to our place there and then I had to get a boiler for it. And if I had known at, uh, then what I learned later on, <coughs> I could have gone from Ken Fife. He had a two, two a cylinder one. It would have came off of some tug that salvaged somewhere. But anyway, I got talking to one of my scouts up in Vernon, and there was a fellow up there who had a boat. He put a steam engine in an old BC ferry lifeboat, a metal one, and he was a genius. He needed a, a welding machine, so he built his own welder. And, uh, and then he, he put a, a transmission in there so he could start it off in a low gear and then shift to a high gear when he got it going. And uh, it still, being the shape it was, it didn't go that fast, and people like to come in around it. And if you're burning the right wood, you can't see any smoke coming out of the stack. So he kept a bit of coal there. When the people came out, he'd throw a little coal in to make some black smoke for them. And uh, uh, so anyway, I had to get a boiler built, and we had about three attempts before we got a boiler built for it, and the boiler cost me more than I thought the whole boat was gonna cost me. <laughs> and so uh, uh, when the Marine Heritage put a price on it, I, didn't, I thought they were right about on the mark what it might be worth there. Okay, um, I think maybe I've covered that. Oh, when, when I did get the uh, boiler built finally, um, 
We took it back down by the uh, by the carvings down there, or where there used to be the uh, loading ramp, where we used to take logs out of there. And Soup Campbell came out, and he lifted the engine in. And what he did, he took the distance and put his uh, crane way out there, and then he turned around and did the same thing over the shore to know, make sure that he could hold it. Well, he let it down there, and. Uh, and that went in fine, and then we had to go and uh, finish putting all the uh, planking on and everything. And I had to raise the cabin deck a bit because of all the uh, uh, pipes thing that had to accommodate. And um, I got a very nice whistle from Ken Fife and another one that came from the mill. And so I had two whistles on. And the, half the fun of uh, running the boat was blowing the whistle. <laughs> and people would come out and spin around us and they'd be going like this, you know. <laughs> and we'd, we'd accommodate. Okay, any questions? <coughs> I must have answered them. Oh, and okay. here we have a lot, a lot of things we found in here. And this is a tortoise shell pair of glasses. The actual lenses are of tortoise shell. So I don't know, they might even be valuable. <laughs> <laughs> so I will leave those out where you can, oh, over here somewhere, you can have a look at them. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Art, uh, Ken McCray had a question. So I did. So I just got something to say to my friend, Art. <laughs> <laughs> so Ken White and I are both uh, freemen of the city for the city of Port Albert. So art had a lot to do with our growing up when we lived in Old Town. Art was not only our scout master, he was also our Sunday school teacher. <laughs> so we had the largest Sunday school class in Old Town, or Alberni. And the reason we had it, because art was also our scout master. <laughs> and so anyway, art, uh, art was really good at boat building. We all knew that because he had probably one of the fastest boats in Alberni. When I was a patrol leader in scouts, we used to go up to his house once a month and have meetings. We all used to look in his shed at that beautiful boat that he had built. Because Art comes from Skipsy Sashendor. Yeah. That's where the old Alberni Valley Times used to be. And so he was really generous. So we uh, uh, used to get in the back of his truck. I don't think we ever had any handrails or anything. No, no. No, we had nothing. <laughs> and uh, so we all jump in there and go up to the lake. And uh, so we'd ride around in the swan. Or We were also big into sailboats. So we were in Scout Second Aerosmith, was in the old Apple Box in Alberni, which is behind where that dog park is now. It was a beautiful place. I think it was the old school where Art went to school above the tracks in Alberni. I think that's, well, that, that's the fire hall where the Catholic Church ended up, or, or the Hells yeah, yeah. ended up. Yeah. 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 So it was a beautiful hall. That was the basketball was huge in that. We had basketball hoops in there. And we had our own shipyard there. So Art put our own shipyard together. So we used to have whalers. So as scouts, we used to do our own work. We used to steam our own wood. We used to do our own work on the boat. We used to uh, make our own oars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And our moms used to get they used to get the uh, parachutes from the Comox base, and they used to put them together, and that was our sail. <laughs> so oh, that's a tense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sail. No, no, sails. Sails. We used to get a whaler, a 28 foot whaler, complete with sails for about $125. <laughs> and we have a bottle drive, and then one day we had a paper drive, and we had enough paper to cover the floor about a foot deep, and then they stopped buying papers. <laughs> so art was not, there was no fear in art. No. So when we used to sail to get too rough, he had a hole in the middle of them boats, and we'd drop a motor down through them. Oh, yeah. It didn't matter if we went to Texado or where in the heck we went to. Art would say, there's no fear, guys, away we go. He always had that little smile on his face and away we go. So we were pretty tough guys. So yeah. And I just one little story. Art tried to bribe my wife one time because uh, uh, he, was, uh, he wasn't the mayor of Parksville at the time, but he was running a big thing at Parksville and they wanted a First Nations theme. And as you know, my wife had the largest First Nations restaurant in BC at one time, probably in Canada. So he was trying to get her to do some cooking. And Dolly was saying, oh, I don't think so. He says, I got a picture. He says, I'm going to take up to your house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a picture of us. We in Texada with no clothes on. <laughs> so he said, that's the thing. That's why I could give to Ken's wife, and she agreed to do the catering. <laughs> so Art was well, we were climbing uh, Mount Tremerton on um, uh, Skeety Island. Yeah, yeah. OK. And uh, it was quite hot. And we came down, and there was a little lake. And so not anything to do but get off the clothes and get in the lake. And there's about four of them in a row along this 
diving board he had in there. And she says, oh, that's Kenny. I recognize his ears. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before you take off, yep. once again, a pleasure to see you. A little something from Maritime Heritage Discovery. Yeah. We wish to recognize our Skipsy and family for their generous donation of the iconic vessel known as the Swan. Our commitment to them is to present, preserve, and promote this classic steamboat with 1890 steam technology now and for years to come. Thank you from all of us at Maritime Heritage. Thank you very much. So come next uh, next summer when we uh, have our next opening, uh, the Swan and uh, the viewing platform and that should all be done. Uh, it's coming the spring. We'll be uh, painting it, uh, repainting it again, recocking it again, and uh, making it, bringing it back to life again. So it, it's not that it's going to be in the water, but uh, you can certainly come down and see what uh, you know 1890 history was all about. So with that art uh, to you and your family, Joe. Uh, Becky, is Becky here tonight? Okay. Uh, Me Mexico. <laughs> Mexico. She's heard the story before, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? Tom and I suggesting that rather than trying on steam, to get an air compressor to put in there. Yeah, we plan to. And put a ramp up, and then you, you for a dollar, they can turn it forward and back the engine, yeah. and for $2, blow the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I helped Art on that boat, this guy that fell off the roof and hurt his legs, he said to Art one day, he says, well, what are you going to pay John for doing all this work? Yeah, I'll let him blow the whistle. <laughs> so I came home one day and I said to my wife, well, I finally got paid today. <laughs> I think that's what we're going to do with all our volunteers that are putting it back together, get to blow the whistle. Okay, without further ado, uh, perhaps I can call on Maureen Brecken to come up and talk about uh, 50th anniversary of Twin Cities Amalgamation. <laughs> 